Here I am. <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. I'm Dennis Reardon, president of Monocotuck Audubon Society, and welcome to this evening's community program. As usual, we'll do our land recognition in which we honor the indigenous communities native to the chapter area, including the Pocusset, Wepawag, Quinnipiac, Tatakit, Monunkatuck, and Hamanasset people. As we advocate for conservation of the land and its wildlife, we're indebted to the work of the native and indigenous people who cherish the land before European colonization. And before we get started, um, please remember to keep yourself muted during the program. If you have questions, you can enter them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. You can also raise your hand at the end um, in the reactions button. I'll have you unmute yourself and uh, you can ask your question. Dr. Robert Klee was commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection under the Malloy administration and is now a lecturer at Yale School of Environment and the Yale Law School. His time at DEEP gives him a unique perspective on the effects of climate change in Connecticut and the ways that federal, state, and local governments and individuals can mitigate them. Rob, welcome and thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis. And I will uh, share my screen and hopefully that'll work. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Or I see have some thumbs up, thank you for, for that. And thank you, Dennis, for the introduction and as well as uh, the pleasure that I have of serving on the Audubon Connecticut board with you um, as one of our uh, ways in which we got to our paths crossed and we could uh, meet each other. Um, as Dennis said, I am uh, going to have a, a more lecture style talk for the first 30 minutes or so, um, but then I am excited to um, hear your questions, to engage in conversation, so I want to make sure we have uh, plenty of time for that at the end. I've been uh, teaching at Yale in Zoom format, hybrid format, all sorts of formats. So I'm a pro at uh, both watching the chat and looking at the screens and having it all uh, hopefully work together uh, uh, in a way that, that makes sense. So um, please uh, um, think of your questions, have them in mind, and uh, we'll go from, from there. So, um, I just want to start by saying that uh, tonight you're going to hear from one perspective. Um, I'm a, as Dennis said, the former state commissioner uh, here in Connecticut, a member of the executive branch, the implementation branch, my favorite branch. No offense to those who are on the legislative uh, side of things. I'm now a lecturer at um, the Yale School of the Environment, Yale Law School, where I teach environmental law and policy, energy law and policy to undergrads, graduate students, and also professional students in an online uh, certificate program in financing deploying clean energy. So I get the breadth of students um, and have the wonderful opportunity to see the opportunities for connecting students across those different parts of their um, life and career. I am a, a PhD scientist, um, industrial ecologist by training, and I do see, uh, um, I said hi to um, Susanna Gradle, um, her husband, Tom Gradle, was my PhD advisor. So this is, Dennis, for, at, at a minimum, you've gotten me uh, the chance to see Susanna again in this uh, setting, and I'm sorry if I'm embarrassing her by giving her a shout out uh, in this group. Um, but I really enjoyed my time uh, as a PhD student. I also am a lawyer and I you know, like law and policy. Um, I'm hopefully the type of lawyer that you would like too, because not all of us are liked um, in this space. Um, and I'm also a dad and I have uh, two boys who I, I love and adore. And hopefully they're now getting old enough where I'm starting to embarrass them. I try not to do that. Um, 
for those of you who uh, remember me in my deep days, they were much younger and always willing to go on a hike or go fishing or uh, now I have a uh, high schooler, which is a different part of my time. So today we're going to talk about um, in the next 30 minutes or so, I hope to cover uh, a case for action why um, and why that resonates here in the US now more than ever. Well, I'm going to talk about the local impacts of climate change, which a lot of you have probably been experiencing and seeing um, from your backyards, the coastline, uh, all along, uh, all around Connecticut, we're seeing the effects of climate change. Then I'm going to make a case for states and other subnational actors. That's where I've um, been focusing my research and teaching on you know, how these are still functioning levels of government. Um, I have my own views of where the federal government is and um, how these entities, which include cities, companies, institutions like Yale, um, can actually make progress on our climate crisis. I'll give a sampling of some of the innovative policy lessons we might learn and then hopefully talk about things we can all do collectively, the steps we can take together uh, to make some progress. So I, for this audience, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on how serious the climate crisis is, but if you've been following the sort of recent um, things issued by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, back in August of last year, they had their sixth assessment report sort of series started coming out with the latest updates on the science of climate change, which painted a fairly stark picture um, that climate change has already begun and has caused significant damage, damage that we actually can't undo at this point. And it squarely pointed the finger at us that the gargantuan output of greenhouse gases in quotes there um, was because of human activity. What's new is in this um, evolving area of science is the ability now to attribute so many more of the changes we see at the global and regional and sometimes down to a local level to human influence and actually start making those climate connections real time to things uh, like storm events that have 20% more water in them because of the heat uh, trapped in the atmosphere and the like. Just one month ago, this report where I have a, a snapshot of came out. It was their latest report on the impacts and how we may adapt um, to climate change. Um, I went across the pond to the BBC, had a good summary of this report, and, and there were five key takeaways. One, it's way worse than we thought. Two, the loss and damage is real, and particularly in the most climate vulnerable communities, and is outpacing our ability to adapt. That's a long one. Three, technology is not a silver bullet. Four, cities actually offer some hope if they are going for renewables and cleaning up transit systems and the like. And five, we have a small window for action and it's unfortunately closing fast. So that's the latest from the, the uh, global scale. It builds on what many of you may have seen just a few years ago, this global warming report uh, on one and a half degrees Celsius that really talked about if that is our global goal as a a threshold to which we don't want to uh, go by, or at least to, if we go by, not go by that far. Um, it implored us to basically to reduce our emissions 40 to 60% globally by 2030. That's an incredibly aggressive amount of uh, greenhouse gas reductions. So it was often reported back then that the world was going to end in 10 years or this sort of hyperbole about that, which is not the case. But these next this next decade is a critical, the choices we make in this next decade are gonna be critical for the long-term habitability of our planet. So that's at the global scale. I want tonight to keep bringing it back down to the national and local scale. At the national scale, our US government and 13 federal agencies actually come together to give our periodic assessments of where we are from a climate perspective. And the last time this happened was actually November 2018. The next one's scheduled to come out, I think, and it was supposed to be this year, but it's going to be delayed a bit to next year. Um, 1,500 pages of the best of uh, US scientists and institutions that basically outline the trouble that we're already experiencing from climate change. Um, and for the Northeast, highlighting the impacts um, to our water, our energy, our transportation infrastructure from severe storms, from drought, from heat waves and flooding. And so I want to take a few moments to do that little deeper dive. Um, 
first of all, what are they, all those greenhouse gases doing while well, they're warming the planet? Um, this is the, uh, the look at the increase in temperature. Um, if fairly dramatically, you've seen that the seven, you know, you've experienced the seven hottest years on record have occurred in the last seven years. Um, 2020 and 2016 were the, the highest amongst that group. Um, and the observed amount of warming, the that sort of hockey, this is the hockey stick uh, curve that Michael Mann is sort of famous for writing about, um, has shown that warming is unprecedented in the last um, 2000 years. Um, and beyond that, actually into the uh, historic record. And the little graph on the right shows that, um, you know, and this is from the latest IPCC report, the, that the, the effect is not, can't be explained by our natural fluctuations, the things that have been happening because our, we tilt a little or we walk a little on our axis or volcanic activity. No, this is actually um, because of human activity. And we're seeing it in the US, the state is now a little bit old um, from the fourth climate assessment that we're seeing that our overall average temperatures um, compared to the first half of the century, most of the US is experiencing um, fairly significant uh, warming. Interesting, I was actually just at a talk um, the other day. There is this interesting sort of gap in the, the mid section of the country where things may have gotten a little cooling. They would actually call it the sort of the cooling sort of hole. Some of that is actually attributed to reforestation. So um, the fact that there are way more trees now than there were actually in the first part of uh, this century and the role that trees plays. We can talk about that in the discussion because trees are often pointed to as planting trees as one of those things, um, maybe in the silver bullet category, but there it's a lot more complicated um, than that. So nationwide heat um, is a challenge. Let's look at our local heat stress. And this is um, NOAA data from uh, Hartford. And you can see that temperatures, the average temperatures in Hartford have increased um, about three degrees um, Fahrenheit over the last 70 years. And actually the rate of change is accelerating. Uh, so that rise in average annual temperatures translates to increased number of days over 90 degrees, which leads to increased heat stress and impacts on human health and the environment. But when we talk about those things, you have to actually also factor in that the impacts of um, heat stress are not felt equally across um, our society and our communities. Who actually does it impact the most? Well, it tends to impact the elderly, the very young, people who are infirm or have other sort of respiratory or other conditions. And it tends to impact um, communities that are marginalized or already have some sort of distress who may not have the resources to cope, including the simple resources of air conditioning, um, which in our older um, urban areas is actually not as ubiquitous as uh, you might think. We're also seeing around the world sea level rise, rising. This is you know, global data um, from a, a bunch of different sources um, where we've seen about eight to nine inches or so of sea level rise since 1880. Um, we've reached in 2020 a sort of new record sort of high um, uh, over uh, 1990 levels. Um, and again, you can see the curves are accelerating um, as we get into uh, the more recent sort of years, the, the speed of, of change uh, increases. And many locations across the United States, our coastlines are now seeing high tide flooding that is 300 to 900% more frequent than it was 50 years ago. So this is just the simple, you know, twice a month high tide, people are experiencing um, more dramatic flood events kind of on a monthly basis. So what does that mean here in Connecticut? Um, in Connecticut, we've actually been seeing um, sea level rise in Connecticut, Long Island Sound in the Northeast that's actually faster than global averages. And I'll talk for a second. There's an interesting sort of science behind that. We've seen about um, 0.25 meters since uh, 1938, which is about 10 inches. Now you might say, well, 10 inches isn't necessarily a lot, um, but 
it really depends from your perspective of do you live in next to a coastal salt marsh do you does your road to your community now flood uh, on those uh, high tide events or are you a utility company with a substation in bridgeport that uh, during our last storm events came within 10 inches of being overtopped by seawater and seawater and electrical equipment really don't mix very well. And there was a risk from that event of 50,000 people being without power in Bridgeport for up to four months if that substation had gone down. That's the type of infrastructure that is at risk. But there's also, I'm talking to the Audubon tonight, there are salt marsh sparrows at risk. And I always, I put this image up and I always am sad when I do realizing what these, um, little chicks are facing. But this is part of our, our challenge because the sparrow puts its cup-shaped nest right at the highest part of the estuary inland from the sort of area where the marsh uh, turns to the open waters. But um, it's a tricky sort of balance of finding that space that is in the grasses that um, is high enough to uh, avoid the high tides, but low enough to escape the predators. So there's a sort of narrow band and the sort of changing flood patterns is sort of disrupting the birds normal sort of pattern. And um, the sparrows are used to losing a few <laughs> eggs and nests. But again, over the past few decades, as the increases in sea level rise have been uh, uh, dramatically increasing, we've been seeing the loss of salt marsh sparrow. And I know your group has been monitoring this in the East River Marsh and Hamanassim Marsh, which are both critical salt marsh sparrow habitats. And I know that you're also thinking about marsh migration and trying to figure out, okay, can we start planning for uh, improvements here? And I'll show an image of some of the work Audubon is doing in Stratford. So from a state perspective and policy perspective, um, uh, we partnered early on with the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation um, and actually got written into statute a mandate for them to actually work on, and they're, they're out of Yukon, Avery Point, really understanding that localized risk of sea level rise here in Connecticut, um, not based on national average, not based on the global averages. Um, and they went about this um, investigation of both our historic tide gauge data, so backwards looking and seeing where we are headed um, if we just looked at history, but then recognizing, well, history is one thing, but we are changing the climate. So they looked at climate models and tried to project what we're anticipated to experience um, in New England. And here's the little fun fact of, of the science here. Um, it turns out because of the Gulf Stream, which is pulling warmer waters from the Caribbean all the way across the Atlantic over to, uh, the, the, to England and to Europe. That's a conveyor belt that is literally pulling water and it is sucking water and really drawing water away from New England. And most climate models have that pull weakening and slowing. So in essence, that conveyor belt as it slows down causes water to slosh back and not get pulled away from New England and in essence stays around New England. So we are actually in these global climate models, a high watermark, so to speak, of sea level rise because of that potential changes in the Gulf Stream current that would in essence stop pulling as fast, meaning there's more water left here, meaning our we're likely going to experience more local sea level rise. And that's part of what the Yukon folks sort of uh, analyzed here. Their end result was that we should plan and for up to 20 inches or 50 centimeters of sea level rise by 2050 um, here in Connecticut. And that's now in statute as a requirement when the state is putting money in, into buildings, roads, infrastructure, long lived things, they have to take that basically two feet of um, potential sea rise into account when they're thinking about the flood elevations and where they're building uh, in potentially sort of critical areas. So um, I like that as kind of a science meets policy and uh, sort of intersection in a, in a state that's willing to actually, you know, recognize sea level rise and climate change is happening and then put it into statute and make sure we're not investing um, improperly in those zones at risk. Globally, the sea surface, the waters are warming, but I wanna again, come back to our local warming. And this is a place where my former agency um, has been on Long Island Sound for um, 
gosh, almost um, over 30, close to 40 years through the uh, through the Dempsey and their Long Island Sound surveys, where they do surveys of both water quality, water temperature at different sort of levels in the sound. And they do trawl surveys where they actually put out a, a trawl net and scoop up the stuff and then count what's there, which I've done, which is kind of a crazy fun sort of event where you're on the deck and suddenly a whole bunch of things are there and they then say, hey, commissioner, come on, grab that fish and measure it. And then, which I was not very good at. Um, they're like, you're too slow, get out of the way because they have to keep doing that. But so they're tracking the increases in water temperature uh, over time. So our Long Island Sound is warming. And what does that mean in terms of our species diversity? Well, we're getting fewer. This graph shows the blue line decreasing of cold water water species, the winter flounder um, is probably the best known example, but probably lobster is there as well, and increases in warm water species, the black line here, um, sea bass, summer flounder, stripers, spider crabs. Um, so our New England-ish fishery is starting to look more like a mid-Atlantic fishery um, because the waters of Long Island Sound are changing. We're more Maryland than Maine now um, as species are having trouble adapting to the new normal of uh, a warmer Long Island Sound. And then precipitation is changing nationwide. Um, precipitation patterns where in the Northeast are in the zone that is likely to get more and heavier participation, precipitation, sorry, but it tends to be patchy. It tends to be you get four or five inches of rain in one single rain event and then weeks of drought in between. Again, much harder for our infrastructure to handle. And you can kind of see it in these trends over time. So over the last 70 years, Connecticut has gotten about an inch more rain per year every decade. So every decade, we're slowly kind of adding another inch of water. But if you look year to year, it's a real messy sort of plot here and you can have periods of drought and periods of heavy rain sort of wet um, years back and forth, all of which makes us challenged in terms of flooding and flooding risk and Irene and Sandy in 2011 and 2012 brought us this, you know, you know, for me at least um, in the time that I've lived here, that sort of you know, in your face, repeated sort of significant um, tropical events or nor'easter type events um, that brought um, storm surge from Long Island Sound up a lot of our river systems, and river flooding from the heavy rain events down, and it actually created this new zone of potential high water that wasn't right on the coastline. It was actually inland a little where rain storm water was meeting storm surge from these um, tropical events um, and a new sort of area of risk, um, which resulted in these sort of, I think this image is from Fairfield with people uh, uh, in a flooded area um, where I grew up. Uh, I grew up in Fairfield, not in this part of town. Little side note from one of those things that you know too much when you're a commissioner of an agency like DEEP. The problem with floodwaters um, is that we tend to put our sewage treatment plants um, at lowest possible places and they tend to get flooded during major flood events. They so always have to assume floodwaters contain sewage. Um, so we don't advise the person walking around in no shirt and uh, in the floodwaters. The person in the boat is probably okay. Um, so I think. Uh, Here's a sort of look at our uh, region around New Haven and great work by the Nature Conservancy and others to really start mapping out what parts of our coastline are vulnerable. And um, I often show this to my students um, at Yale and talk about how close the flow, where is Ikea on this map? Where is uh, Tweed uh, Airport on this map? Um, and um, where in the Fairhaven community are sort of vulnerable sort of uh, areas where infrastructure, where people live, um, uh, what parts are, are at risk um, here. And the, what I alluded to earlier was this, um, the role that our coastal uh, marshes um, can play in absorbing you know storm energy acting as a sponge and in this case and this is an example of where Audubon has partnered with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, over in the Stratford Bridgeport line at the Great Meadows Salt Marsh to restore habitat to 
um, increase its sort of you know uh, resilience capacity and build new mounds of earth, which I've seen to try to encourage habitat for salt marsh sparrow that is above the um, the uh, the the flood line. Thank you, Dennis, for being on the spot with the chat on uh, description of what's going on there. So again, a real great role I think for Audubon to play, recognizing the value of these ecosystems to fish and birds, um, and the importance of these ecosystems to protecting um, our built infrastructure, which is close by. This is one that had been degraded and the amount of sort of junk being pulled out of here. Um, and when restored, we'll have trails and the ability to actually experience the marsh uh, and all of its uh, wonderful sort of uh, life in a marsh uh, in new ways. So I want to um, be cognizant of time and make sure I get to some of the things that are happening. I do tend to, when you get me after after hours, I tend to like to, to sort of go uh, to, to wax uh, a little more poetic. Um, but I just want to sort of highlight, this is actually in grad school. This is Cozy Beach over in East Haven. Um, I lived on Cozy Beach when I was in grad school, not in this house that fell down, um, but the forestry school always had a presence over there. Um, and this is where the experience with climate change is starting to show up um, in the survey work that uh, my colleagues at the Yale Program on Climate Communication, which is a terrific resource. They're surveying America and what their sort of relationship and views on global warming is. And in just near term sort of trends, the amount of people who are alarmed and concerned are growing, the amount that are cautious or disengaged is, um, is shrinking. And there will always be this sort or dismissive or doubtful sort of ban, but it's going to stay around, you know, 20% or, or less, which is part of the reality. It's an interesting way to sort of think about the um, attitudes and the, the shift in attitudes that's really been happening over the last few years as more of these dramatic climate events are above the fold in the newspaper, they're on people's um, social media feeds, there is, you know, increasing coverage. So I want to spend, maybe I'll spend like 10 minutes um, or so, which is a quick tour of some policy options, things that are happening. Um, I'll sort of, you know, I, I do, you know, when I teach, I usually dedicate a class of, is there an actual federal climate policy? Um, my answer is not really, um, even though we've had 130 plus years of federal involvement in energy policy, it's often schizophrenic. It's it's investments here and uh, uh, investments in oil infrastructure. Oh, and there's some clean stuff too. It doesn't have uh, the coherence. And then on the purely climate side of things um, at the federal level, we haven't done uh, nearly uh, enough. And you can probably, um, you know, our recent you know, attempts uh, in the Biden administration to pass anything sort of show that sort of struggle. The state or local level, there's been a lot more happening, and I would argue that they're kind of a, a microcosm of functioning government that is happening at the state level. Not all states, um, but a lot of states. Um, and cities and companies and institutions are actually doing some real innovation here. Part of that is, part of that, is that they're not quite as hyper-partisan as you see in Washington. Um, there's a willingness to collaborate. And state and local sort of governments are much closer to people and they actually are in some ways are much more accountable to their constituents because of that um, closeness. But it also, it's interesting when you add up the, you know, the, the types of these subnational actors that are committed to action on climate, it's a pretty significant and powerful coalition if you could get it all to move in, in the same direction at the same time. But the number of states, cities, companies, um, and institutions that have said when the, um, the US backed out of the Paris Agreement under the Trump administration, there are all those institutions that no, we're still in. We still wanna be an active participant. And it turns out they're almost 70% of the GDP of the country almost two thirds of all Americans and about half of our emissions from that sort of collective mass uh, from below that we're willing to, um, to keep the staying the course and actually do innovation and in climate policy. And for me, the, the sort of lawyer in me and the scientist in me actually likes uh, one of my favorite Supreme Court quotes of all time is from Justice Brandeis during the original New Deal era in the 30s um, in a 
dissent actually in uh, a case called New State Ice Company versus Liebman where Justice Brandeis described how a state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. And this is, uh, Brandeis was the originator of the phrase, the laboratory of the states. Um, and I would argue that states and cities and institutions have been running some pretty grand experiments on what economy-wide deep decarbonization policy could look like. And to me, it kind of looks like this photo, which. Um, um, though these are cooling towers that may evoke uh, images of the Simpsons and uh, nuclear power, these are actually cooling towers um, that were only recently installed at the last coal-fired power plant in Massachusetts that were being blown up, being imploded to make way for a new offshore wind energy hub um, in Massachusetts. So this is the kind of spirit of, of rebirth and renewal and replacement of fossil fuel infrastructure with uh, clean energy infrastructure that I want to take a few minutes to talk to before I get to everyone's uh, questions, which I hope are, are coming. So what are the what are states and cities doing? Well, part of it is that they're actually setting real targets and, and developing sort of mandates and, and rules. And I sort of um, have two examples here. Um, the electric sector is going to be a huge part of this transformation and decarbonization effort. And uh, I worked on a project last year um, with a law student exploring how utility commissions, public utility regulators, the, the government entity that is usually in an office not <laughs> that almost no one knows about where they are in, in Connecticut, it's called PIRA, the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, how they're important to a lot of decisions that are being made at the state level on the deployment of clean energy. So it turns out that these um, utility commissions in some states have been given a new mandate, have been actually told that their traditional role of making sure that they're safe and reliable and affordable energy should now include things like clean energy, should include things like uh, environmental protection, and could include um, a utility commission that is charged in its fundamental law, its charter, its, you know, its governing sort of mandate to address systematic injustice in the energy system or energy burden disparities and the like. So by changing the, the sort of fundamental, you know, these are the rules of the road for utility regulation, it used to just be make sure that the things stay up, which they've done an okay, not, not always the greatest job, it's a challenging job under climate change, but they think the energy is reliable and accessible and affordable. What if they are now also as part of their mission, making sure it's clean and making sure that it's equitably um, uh, distributed. Similarly, we've seen states that say, okay, let's get involved in actually dictating what type of energy is coming out of the plugs in all of our state. When, when you plug in any sort of electric appliance, there are a number of states who've been setting renewable or clean energy standards that are requiring their utilities to not just give whatever's cheapest, but to actually deliver on date certain certain percentages of renewables, which would be largely wind and solar, or broader clean energy, which may include zero carbon large-scale hydropower or zero-carbon nuclear. So depending on what state you're in, you can have these sort of state mandates that are saying, we don't want just whatever energy that is being produced. We want to dictate what you're uh, producing um, by percentage and have that increase over time, um, which has been a sort of change in uh, philosophy. It was something that was going to be part of the Biden administration's Build Back Better uh, framework, but got dropped because uh, uh, the senator from West Virginia did not uh, like how that program was going to work. Uh, but we can talk about that more later. Um, what else are states doing? They're, they're embracing sort of innovation in the energy space, and there's a whole lot of it going on. I'll give you know some quick examples on sort of modernization of the grid and the sort of importance of uh, information as uh, a valuable asset. Um, there's a, and I, I see Leslie's uh, uh, question in the chat. Um, I will, uh, the quick answer to that is yes, there is uh, accountability because if you don't hit those mandates or targets, there's a penalty assessed. So you have to pay something instead. 
Um, so it's a, a alternative compliance payment is what it's called. So there's, if you're not delivering the clean energy, you're paying for it and that money then goes usually invested into clean energy programs or efficiency programs. Um, so embracing local clean energy through a smarter grid that is communicating, that is controlling devices that, you know, where my kids are, my older one in particular, um, being able to control on your phone the heating and cooling systems or being willing to give up control to Google or Nest or uh, whoever has uh, the thermostat that you're running to allow them to take a fleet worth of houses all with interconnected thermostats and in the summer dial the temperature up a degree to make you know your air conditions run a little uh, less frequency, frequently. Um, the picture here is of a, a Tesla Powerwall um, project in Vermont, where the Vermont Green Mountain Power, their utility up there, partnered with Tesla to deploy 2000s of these battery storage devices in Vermont homes, which would provide the home a battery if they have solar, would actually extend their solar uh, into the evening hours. If the grid went down, it would be a, a battery backup. But in exchange for a discounted battery, um, the people who signed up for this project were willing to let the utility control the battery on the hazy, hot, and humid days in the summer when the energy system is most stressed and when an energy system has to call on its oldest, dirtiest, and most expensive resources. And um, when they were rolling this out a few years ago, I happened to be up in Vermont and I saw, a, I woke up to the morning news and saw a story about how this fleet of batteries on that hazy, hot, and humid day in Vermont was gonna save 500,000 to a million dollars that day in avoided cost from those dirty old peaking generators. So you might, you know, see that you have a few of those hazy, hot and humid days that are instead served by batteries that had been filled by the, the solar rays on many of these houses is a much better way to approach the problem of delivering energy at peak times. Um, and it's a type of creative, you know, innovative approach to uh, utility uh, delivery of energy um, at uh, the um, household scale. Another, so money is a big question and a big sort of issue in the deployment of clean energy and the creation of uh, sort of a new decarbonized um, world. And there's a lot of potential sort of flows of capital um, from government government grants and programs from private capital or hybrids of that. And I want to highlight a few things that are happening in the states and at companies. Um, one, states are innovating with things called green banks, and Connecticut has one of the first ones, I think the first one in the country. Um, that is a an entity that's designed um, to use a little bit of state money of ratepayer money to attract private capital to invest in clean energy through leverage and through reducing risk of, of investments. And this Green Bank model has grown from Connecticut. It's now in, I think, uh, over a dozen jurisdictions. There are state level ones and city ones and county ones, all sort of recognizing that um, the government doesn't have enough money to spend to, to solve this problem, but private investors do. And private investors, though, are often reluctant to invest if there's uh, risk involved. So there's this ability of a green bank to offer uh, a first, be a first loss, you know, put their money into a project and have it be the first losses to be taken out of their money and not the private capital is just one example. There are also plenty of corporate uh, entities, Microsoft's recent announcement of their corporate efforts to uh, reduce their emissions and invest a billion dollars in a climate innovation fund. Dennis had given me the, um, the hint that folks may be interested in um, challenges along our coastline. So I wanted to throw in a slightly controversial one uh, about managed retreat and um, we had a speaker at Yale um, just uh, earlier this spring um, that had written an article about um, Sandy, um, uh, post Sandy sort of responses in Staten Island about where repeatedly flooded homeowners were actually um, 
asking for to be bought out to be actually um, uh, give uh, um, state funds to uh, provide um, them an opportunity to leave that property and move somewhere else that had been repeatedly um, flooded. There's a version of this that's happened in West Haven, Connecticut, um, where the um, Department of Agriculture's National Natural Resources Conservation Service has um, invested, I think, four to six million dollars in this uh, Old Creek neighborhood in West Haven near their um, Sioux Shreeman plant to do um, buyouts of homes that were built in kind of marshland um, that wants to be marsh again, that do get repeatedly flooded. And what's interesting about this federal program is that they pay the market rate before the storms hit. So they actually pay you the value of your house before um, it may have been devalued if it was flooded. And um, they've had about 20 or, or, or um, originally they had 20 houses. I think they had another, um, 40 parcels that have sort of signed up and they're now restoring, they're removing those houses, restoring marshland, um, and again, using that natural absorptive capacity. I want to do just one more thing before I open up to questions about equity and, and inclusion, which is a big um, sort of challenge in the clean energy space. And it's a lot of what I um, am currently working on at Yale is thinking about how um, the clean energy system can actually deliver its benefits um, to everyone. And that's something um, started working on in the state with the Green Bank, um, who was in charge of Connecticut's residential solar program. And they realized early on that they were offering incentives and the incentives were largely being taken up by people living in Westport and Woodbridge and not so much in Waterbury and Bridgeport and um, in our urban areas. Um, in the early days, about 80% of our solar installations went to wealthier communities that were um, over, um, uh, that were above area median income, and only 20% of the projects were going to uh, homes in low and moderate income communities so where they actually are suffering higher energy burden, where there were a higher percentage of their you know, household budget is going to the costs of their uh, energy, like you know, up towards of 10 to 15% of their household budget going to keep the lights on and to keep a home warm or, or cool, uh, depending on the season. Whereas solar can help dramatically cut bills, it could cut bills in half for, uh, or more for, for folks who go solar. So the Green Bank decided, okay, we have our standard program, let's modify it to really target those communities that could use more help in going solar. So they first thing they, so they called it their solar for all program, um, which first offered three times the normal sort of financial incentives. So if you're in a low and moderate income uh, customer. So um, that was both a positive for the customer and for the installers who might, who then had more incentive to target um, low and moderate income uh, customers. Then the Green Bank partnered with a, a company called Posigen, which um, was actually born out of um, post-Katrina uh, um, in Louisiana. And they have a solar um, lease product that is targeted for the low and moderate income space where they have a, um, where their lease and the, the amount you pay each month is usually about um, a half of what you're currently paying for your energy bills. Um, and the, the main trick of their, or the, it's not a trick, but their, their main sort of um, innovation is that they don't actually um, do use credit scores. They don't, um, which has been the, the barrier that is for most traditional lease products or loan products is they look at the uh, credit score and in low and moderate income space, some people have no credit scores or they have terrible credit scores. And instead, Posigen, focused on their bill payment histories and other sort of the length of ownership of their home, other sort of indicators of why someone may not be as risky uh, uh, um, 
to lend to or to offer a lease to. And in so doing, that helped transition our Connecticut solar program in just six years, they were now experiencing half of their solar installs going to areas above um, area median income and half going to below area median income with a dramatic increase in the poorest sort of segment um, where they used to only have 2% of all of the projects was now up to 13% in the most distressed and poorest communities. So to me, this is a story that I, you know, this is a, a case that I usually present to my students of how policy matters and your sort of policy choices and you can use you know um, innovation and in policy increasing the amount of the incentive finding a partner that is willing to find alternative underwriting being a green bank that is willing to loan that um, posigen company money at a rate lower than the banks are still nervous <laughs> wait who are you lending to you're lending to people who have terrible credit scores we're not going to give you money unless you or we're going to charge you you know uh, really high rates on that money if we're going to lend it to you so again a green bank that can come in and provide low cost capital to help get this launched and their default rates are not much higher than in you know, the rates um, of leases for um, other sort of solar um, developers who uh, who are just going on credit scores. So they, they've sort of shown that this is not a market to be afraid of or, and the risks are not as uh, dramatic, which is again, part of the Green Bank sort of mantra. Um, I'll kind of save the what's happening in the Biden administration maybe for the questioning because I want to sort of wrap up here and, and make sure I leave time for questions and talk about um, the, the, the things that we're seeing at the state level, are we at this time where we're ready for federal action? And then I want to offer some suggestions about what we all can do together. So I'll go back to our um, Yale program on climate communication who have polled, you know, who's willing to start regulating carbon dioxide as pollutant. And surprisingly, 75% of the country is. This is across the board in all these counties everywhere in the country are actually willing to start regulating, you know, what's um, those sort of most common sort of greenhouse gas. So again, are we seeing a willingness, at least in the general population? It may not be reflected yet in Washington, which uh, we can talk about the challenges of getting anything done in Washington. But I want to sort of um, start closing with, you know, things that we can all do, because um, oftentimes you're felt that, you know, these are big sort of global issues, large issues. What can you know, little of me do? And I have five suggestions, which I've sort of gleaned from. Um, uh, other sort of scholars here, so I'm not, not going to say these are mine and original. Um, one is um, something we can all do is evaluate our personal options, sort of think about what we can do in our own home. Can we install solar or battery storage? Can we electrify our heating and cooling? Can we buy electric vehicle? Can we look at our investment portfolio and align it towards clean energy and away from fossil fuels? This is, these are all great steps not steps that everyone can take, you know, financially or otherwise. And I don't want anyone to feel like the trap which the fossil fuel companies have actually laid in front of us, um, that it should be all on us, on our shoulders. Um, the, it, the fossil fuel companies have actually been leading proponents of, you know, and have secretly sort of funded doing those carbon trackers and other sorts of things. So I don't want to fall into that trap, but you can take sort of, there are options for you to personally sort of reduce your carbon burden. But I wanna then take it, okay, what can we do more collectively? So a second option is to evaluate your network. Where do you work? Where do you go to school? What about your town or your church or your synagogue? Have they explored clean energy options? Can you start bringing together a group of folks to work on it? Um, what is the, is there a climate strategy for your company? Do they have a green team, a sustainability team? Is there a town-wide clean energy task force? Always better to sort of take your individual energy and, and join it up together with the team. Third, um, you should let your elected leaders know your views on the topic at all levels, at local, state, and federal, individually as part of a campaign. You know, someone needs to be that balancing voice against the millions and millions of dollars that oil companies are spending on lobbying. So um, why not us? Um, 
fourth, and I, I, I'm now, I think I'm getting, this one came from a book, um, All That We Can Save is a collection of essays um, by women leaders in uh, climate action and climate scientists, um, where they sort of labeled it, figure out your superpower um, and how you can use that superpower uh, to address the climate crisis. So what I mean is here, some of you in this audience are artists. I know I know some of you are, some are writers or communication professionals or financial advisors. The climate crisis is so broad and the amount of people we need involved is so wide. Um, we need all of those entities engaged. So your talents, and you are talented, um, will be useful in some way. And so figuring out how to align your talents and superpowers to what the climate crisis needs. And then the last thing, and you're already doing this by coming to this talk tonight, is to actually talk about global warming and the climate crisis at events like this with your family, with your friends. Uh, Catherine Hayhoe, who's someone I, I follow, um, who's really, she's a climate scientist at Texas. Texas, Texas Tech. Um, she always puts this as one of the top of her list of what to do is just keeping the climate crisis in mind and sort of top of conversation. Um, and those challenges, those conversations can be challenging. I know in family ones often are the most challenging, but there's a lot of resources there as well. But having this as a continuing conversation is um, one of the most important things we can do. So I know I went a little over time on me talking, and I apologize uh, for that. I'll just sum it up that um, we know that the climate crisis is serious. We know that it's hitting us close to home. I spent probably more time than I should have on that part, but I know there's we care about our local ecosystems and the vulnerable um, sort of groups and um, including uh, vulnerable bird populations. I gave you just a smattering, I, you'd have to take my full course um, to get the full details on all the things that are actually, things that are encouraging that are happening at the state and local level um, and in institutions. And um, together, I think we can find uh, uh, a way forward and uh, be the change we wish to see in the world. So I will pause there um, and open it up to questions and uh, close with a huge thank you um, to Dennis for having me and um, happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks, Rob. Excellent. Um, if you have a question, uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask it. And with folks, would you like me to stop the screen sharing or um, leave anything up? Yeah, go, go ahead and stop the screen share. Okay. I have a question. Um, of what value would um, us changing our heating systems to heat pumps, either air or geothermal make? Yeah, that is a great question. And um, I roughly sort of calculate our Connecticut level greenhouse gas emissions are come from about 30% from the electric system, about 40% from transportation and 30% from building heating and cooling. So those are the big three movers. Now that overlooks there are some from wastes and agricultural and sort of, you know, some land using. So my numbers are not perfect there. Maybe I should be 30, 30 and there's 10 of other, um, but that big chunk of our, our um, climate sort of challenge and our emissions challenge comes from the way we heat and cool our buildings. Electrification is our sort of near term sort of solution there. And whether that's air source heat pump, ground source heat pump, to me, that's all about electrifying your system and not having uh, fossil fuel combustion as your source uh, of, of heating and cooling. Um, the challenges, and um, I'm currently going through this, trying to, uh, to install one on, on my house. A um, couple of challenges, one supply chain, um, which has hit that uh, part uh, hard. Um, there are incentives, and some of those incentives have been um, increasing as of late, which is a good thing. Um, but generally, they're still a bit more expensive than 
traditional energy systems. The third challenge is that there, it's, there are a few installers and they're growing sort of, you know, you know, month by month and year by year, but it is a different type of technology that takes some experience and expertise and a lot of installers who aren't comfortable with it um, or it hasn't been the thing they've been doing for 30 years it takes a little bit of, wait you sure you want that <laughs> or wait can i just convince you to have something i oh, know i really do want it i do want a a, a, a heat pump um, so there's there's a bit of inertia to sort of overcome um, though frankly with the crisis in ukraine and the sort of um, more front page news of the challenges of relying on uh, foreign sources of oil and the sort of fluctuation of oil prices. More and more people will be like, oh, maybe I should be thinking about um, uh, electrifying my heating and cooling. And it will be impactful because it is such a significant part of our uh, emissions uh, profile. This is also, I've got a question. Sure, go right ahead. Um, increasingly, I think there's a lot of private, I, you know, a lot of residential and businesses that are, are you know, rental. It's not the owner making it. I mean, the owner makes the decision, but I don't think they're motivated because they just pass the cost on. They don't want to put the money up front to prove whether it's air conditioning, electrical, that could be. Um, they just pass it on. I mean, part of the business has been. I, I'm actually again. Landlord could care less. And there, you know, there's a lot of rental property, whether it's your home, how is there any you know talk or anything you know of in trying to incentivize those folks because something to care. <laughs> Yeah, Leslie, it's a great question. You highlight what's often called the landlord tenant divide on so many sort of clean energy or efficiency programs, where if you're the landlord, why are you spending money to help your tenant reduce its uh, reduce their bills? Um, where's your what profit do you see? Now, there are some who will argue, well, there's now an increasing demand for people who want to live in more energy efficiency homes. You might be able to rent it at um, a higher rate or a higher price. Um, but that's probably less of our our New England sort of uh, example, more in the kind of booming sort of marketplaces where there are people who are you know, um, competing for sort of new business. There are some options for renters, including shared clean energy or often called shared solar to try to get um, the, uh, to get those who don't have control over their roof can't go solar on their own to be able to um, buy in through a co-op style that's not Connecticut's version, but to, in essence, buy shares in a solar array somewhere else and have it virtually sort of credited against your bill. Um, Connecticut's version is not quite that. It has a fairly complicated and lengthy sign-up process and a whole bunch of statutory uh, elements of who can sign up and who can't sign up. Um, but the um, work with the, the Green Bank has been trying to figure out that sort of multifamily housing sort of challenge and where they can provide the, to make that sort of choice at that sort of moment of choice of, are you gonna put in more efficient uh, HVAC system, heating, heating systems, um, appliances, et cetera. If that choice becomes a, a wash, if it's an equal sort of price choice because of an intervention, a subsidy, a rebate, a financing product, et cetera. Um, that is part of the, the sort of attempts to make that choice less of a burden on that landowner when they're uh, the, the landlord when they're making that sort of initial choice. But Leslie, you're, you're highlighting one of the hardest sort of problems we sort of have right now. Um, so um, there are things happening around the edges, but part of what um, some of my students are going to hopefully work on this summer is trying to figure out other sort of innovative pathways to, to assist renters who tend to get sort of left out, um, definitely of solar programs and sometimes with efficiency programs when they're not in control. 
Mary, I see a question from you. How do we, in the chat, how do we get government leadership to direct all of us to conserve energy rather than um, mitigating higher costs of gas with tax reduction, uh, et cetera? Yeah, so that's, Mary, that's a great question. And um, it also, it, it is a challenging sort of question at a time when um, when the cost of, of energy is is high and being being sort of on a roller coaster with sort of global sort of fossil fuel prices and we're getting this sort of gas tax holiday that's coming through as well. Um, so it's it it's conservation. Um, which has always been sort of touted as the sort of the first and cheapest thing to do. A dollar spent on conservation is probably your best and most you know impactful dollar uh, in avoiding the use of energy. It is a longer lead time. It, it, the, one of its challenges is that it takes some time you know for those type of interventions. We do have a number of programs in the state that are um, trying to get people to do home energy audits. We actually require a home energy audit. Um, and efficiency measures before you go solar to try to make sure if you're entering one of our clean energy programs, you're also bringing efficiency along with it. Um, we have kind of hidden sort of efficiency programs that have basically made uh, every light bulb you buy at a big box store an LED and made those LEDs cheaper. So that is actually part of our Connecticut approach to um, broad scale efficiency is actually helping subsidize, making again that choice, the only choice is an LED now and that LED choice is cheaper because of, of subsidy because those light bulbs um, are um, dramatically um, use less energy. Um, the push towards um, actually Dennis's question on electrification is can also be a form of efficiency. So um, electric heating and cooling units are much more efficient definitely than 70s vintage electric resistance heaters, which we still about 10% of the homes in Connecticut actually have those awful 70s vintage sort of baseboard electric sort of things that basically are like running a hairdryer um, in your house. Um, and they're way more efficient than oil. Um, oil, even the best of oil burners, maybe get 75 to 80% efficiency. Um, and they compete favorably Though price-wise, it sort of depends, but efficiency-wise, they're as efficient as the most efficient natural gas burners. But Mary, you've sort of, I now see is, but do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I, well, I, I'm not talking so much about uh, the market incentives, but I'm talking about leadership, governors, president, um, talking about reducing your dependence on this fossil fuel energy um, by a percentage, for instance, like Jimmy Carter did, and maybe it's politically just not feasible right now, but I know, you know, when I was young, Jimmy Carter said, put your thermostat down to 50 to 70 or whatever it was and drive at 55. You know, we're not hearing those messages, any kind of sacrifice in order to lower our dependence on, uh, you know, fossil fuels and forms of energy that, that are not sustainable. And I, I want to hear that from our leaders and I'm not hearing, it's all about market and how we can, you can save money um, with all these programs. So that's my <laughs> soapbox. No, and, and say, and um, I too am frustrated in that it seems like a missed opportunity, particularly right now. And I don't fully, I mean, I, I have a, I have guesses, but I, you know, part of that challenge is the political one and this sort of fear of upsetting the fossil fuel industry, which is, you know, what I know, I, I know that I have that same sort of, you know, you know, but if at any moment in time, you think that now would be a time to really put the fossil fuel industry on their, on their heels and actually have them explain the windfall profits they're currently taking off of these extremely high prices. And, you know, that's, that's, that would even be a more, you know, putting it over to their, you know, to justify how they could possibly be, you know, collecting this much money right now at a time when they could be contributing to the reduction of this. Um, and not only that with the war in Ukraine and everybody wants yeah. to do something that would be also help the cause of the war. Yep. No, and, and to me, that's that 
core missed opportunity that this should be. And we're seeing there are some signs of it. And there's this sort of question, is this, could this be a moment where Europe actually then says, yeah, we're actually, thank you, we're going to accelerate our, you know, complete decarbonization and break free from reliance on that fossil fuel pipeline coming out of Russia through things like air sorties pumps and through electric vehicles and, and really double down on those investments. Um, and the U.S. could have a similar, you know, effort, um, again, um, to it, you're right. It, it does get into this sort of challenging world of sacrifice. Where we're not willing to sort of ask people to turn their thermostats down, um, which is part of why the sort of tech has sort of stepped in to kind of do that for people, or to sort of offer that as you know, sign up for this program and actually give up some control and then let others sort of, you know, drive your temperatures down. Um, but I, I do feel a similar frustration that why it's not part of the, um, the, the sort of Biden conversation. Though I'm seeing from Robin in the chat, um, the uh, Defense Protection Act to try to, um, uh, which is this fascinating sort of tool. I also heard that, um, I think it was um, Bill McKibben sort of offered the suggestion to use the Defense Production Act to right. build a bunch of air source heat pumps and send them to Europe and to sort of accelerate electrification of heating and cooling. Um, I'm, those are, the question is why, if not now, when are we going to take that type of sort of bold, you know, action? And instead we're seeing, gas tax holidays and other sorts of things will just keep us in our um, over consuming. So just keep pounding on our leaders to, mm -hmm. to send that message. I, I mean, I, just, I don't know what else to do. Yeah. Thank you. No, appreciate the question. Other questions? From yes, I have another question. Going back to the Vermont program with the Tesla batteries. How many did they install? I think their first run of it was 2000, but I think since then they've, um, I think the program has continued. So I'm not sure where they're, they may be double that by now. And um, Connecticut actually just launched a similar um, battery storage program this year, um, which also will have- How much do they cost? So the, the typical Tesla Powerwall, and people should correct me if I'm wrong here. My numbers might be a little old. There's the, I think they're about, let's put them at about $6,000 for a Tesla Powerwall and they were offering them at 1500. So, you know, basically a third the price or plus or minus. Um, so, but the, so, the cost that was, the price that was paid to Tesla was around 6,000. Yeah, although I don't, Ford. I've never been able to, to, to get into the details of whether Tesla gave a discount on that sort of bulk sort well, but of I'm, purchases. I'm, I'm trying to figure out, so 6,000 of them, $6,000 and 2,000 of them, that'd be $12 million. Yep. And they say they saved half million. a million dollars every time they used them? Yeah, about that pays for itself pretty quickly. Pretty darn quickly, yeah. <laughs> Which is why so many states are actually sort of copying that model and have sort of broken through to the utility regulatory commission to say, hey, this one actually makes economic sense. Plus you're not, right. And it has, that's just straight electric savings or savings from that really expensive peak generator. It doesn't even take into account the health benefits and, you know, you don't even have to go to the other math of, you know, right. justification because of, just you know, dollars reduced and asthma. It's just purely don't buy the expensive thing. Instead, turn on your fleet of uh, grid connected controllable batteries. So, yeah. Other questions? Oh, I see that um, Rob Rock gave a, uh, a plug for the Environmental Film Festival. Yep. Yeah, so um, just on a personal note, I've enjoyed coming back to the School of the Environment. It's where I've done, uh, I spent a while. I've got to work with uh, folks again, including uh, uh, my former 
PhD advisor and uh, and colleagues, and so that's been a treat for me to to come back home to New Haven. Last call for questions. Well, once again, thanks, Rob. Uh, very enlightening. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, you have a recording. You have, um, and Dennis, I sent you the um, my slides as well. And um, feel free to share my email as well, Robert. Uh, I'll throw it in the chat um, for folks who want um, very good any follow up questions. I'm happy to answer them. And. Uh, Great to see everyone tonight. And thank you. And next month, believe it or not, on April 12th, we'll be in person at uh, Guilford Community Center with uh, a program, Ancient Wisdom, Modern Hope, Relearning Environmental Connectiveness with uh, Jim Powers. And I hope to see some people there. It would be nice to see, see some faces that are bigger than a little square on the screen. Um, thanks, everybody. Good night. Thanks.